So today's class is on surgical techniques, uh, part one. So initially we had thought that we will be able to cover the resection procedures or palliative procedures and hemispheric disconnection. But uh, as I was making these slides, I realized quite quickly that it is not possible to cover all these. There's a little bit of, a, uh, of topics that need to be discussed in some detail. So today's uh, lecture will only cover resection procedures and palliative procedures and we'll cover the hemispheric disconnection in part two. So getting into our resection procedures, so I hope that you can recall some of the things that we have discussed in the previous two lectures regard, with regards to epilepsy. So this will help you uh, particularly with this lecture and then with answering some of the questions that we'll be discussing later on. Uh, if you have not uh, attended these lectures, it's also fine. I don't think that will really hamper your learning. So the first section is on resection procedures. And the first uh, topic we'll be discussing is anterior medial temporal lobectomy, the most common epilepsy surgery that is performed. Okay, so anterior medial temporal lobectomy along with amygdala hippocampectomy is performed mostly for mesial temporal sclerosis. And that is the most common indication for epilepsy surgery. It's also the standard for epilepsy surgery as in all outcomes of epilepsy surgery are compared with uh, mesial temporal sclerosis outcomes. So the best surgical outcomes that you have in epilepsy currently are for mesial temporal sclerosis. Right. So when it comes to surgery for mesial temporal sclerosis, the standard for that surgery is temporal lobectomy with amygdalo hippocampectomy. Now, uh, the mesial temporal lobe can be a quite complicated structure and there's a lot of different anatomic landmarks which are very important to learn, especially for understanding how the surgery is performed. Now, there's a very good paper by Roton on the uh, anatomy of the mesial temporal lobe but I think that's a little bit too detailed so we'll just learn whatever is the important surgical requirements uh, to know uh, with a few pictures over here. So the important anatomic landmarks for uh, MTS surgery would be the sylvan fissure right here. So obviously below the sylvan fissure where you have your entire temporal lobe. There's also another structure on the inferior temporal surface that is the collateral sulcus which is also important. There's a structure located on the medial surface of the hippocampus, that is the hippocampus sulcus, and we'll see that in a few pictures later on. But a very, very important structure when it comes to this uh, surgery is the inferior choroidal point. Now, this is also called the velum terminal, and it marks four very important things. It marks the anterior end of the fornix, so that is where the fornix starts being formed. There's also a sulcus which uh, is running up till the inferior choroidal point on the uncus. You can see it from the outside. So if you're looking here, this is the uncle sulcus, right? So it runs up till the inferior choroidal point over here, right? And then behind the uh, inferior choroidal point is where the origin of the choroidal, choroidal fissure is located. So that is the uh, fissure between the thalamus and the hippocampus over here. And that is the fissure through which the anterior choroidal artery enters. So that is uh, that also starts at the inferior choroidal point and it is located behind the head of the hippocampus. And the inferior choroidal point also marks the junction of the body and the head of the hippocampus. So in this corona view, we can see the important structures of the temporal lobe. So this is the lateral neocortex with the superior temporal gyrus, middle, middle temporal gyrus and the inferior temporal gyrus. This is the fusiform gyrus and next to the fusiform gyrus and in between the fusiform gyrus and the parahippocampal uh, gyrus you'll find the collateral sulcus over here. Right? So uh, then you have the superior temporal sulcus and the inferior temporal sulcus over here. So that is the lateral temporal lobe. All structures me medial to that is the mesial temporal lobe. So the important structure in the mesial temporal lobe, the most important one obviously is the hippocampus. So as you can see it's shaped like a seahorse. Okay, and the other important structures right below the hippocampus and connected to it is the parahippocampal gyrus. And in the anterior part of the temporal lobe, in front of the hippocampus is usually where you'll find the amygdala located over here. The amygdala is more or less what connects the hippocampus below with the basal ganglia above. So it is connected to the temporal stem and then going into the frontal white matter. Okay, so these are the other structures which are important to know. So this is an inferior view. So you can see the uncus over here. The uncus is a triangle shaped structure. There is an anterior border and there's a posterior border and there's an uncle notch. Uh, 
right next to the uncus you have here the parahippocampal gyrus right and then right here in the anterior part of the uncus is where you would find the amygdala and then this is a magnified view of the hippocampus we don't really have to know in a significant amount of detail the entire uh, microsurgical anatomy of the hippocampus but if you really want to know you can refer to the paper by Roton. okay so this is a view through while after your temporal neocortex is removed and you have opened the ventricle and you're looking through the lateral wall of the ventricle so as you can see this here is the head of the hippocampus this here is the body of the hippocampus the junction of the head and the body of the hippocampus is the inferior choroidal point so this is the point at which the choroidal plexus will start and that is also the point at which the anterior choroidal artery will enter so this is the choroidal fissure and that separates the hippocampus over here from the thalamus above so usually what we do for resecting the hippocampus is introduce a retractor lift up the structures above the choroidal fissure widen this choroidal fissure and then we can start rolling this hippocampus off open up the hippocampal sulcus and remove this hippocampus important vasculature when it comes to a temporal lobectomy you should know particularly about the vein of labe and obviously try to preserve it another important vessel would be the anterior choroidal artery which we would encounter when we're removing the hippocampus right apart from that the temporal lobe is a quite eloquent structure and it is not uh, like it has there are absolutely no deficits if you remove the temporal lobe so it is important to know which are the areas of the temporal lobe that we can remove so the most important function in the temporal lobe is obviously language and what has been found with studies is that there's a very low probability of finding language in the anterior three centimeter of the middle and the inferior temporal gyrus but it is possible to find language behind three centimeters the superior temporal gyrus actually has extensive language representation along its entire length, even in the anterior 3 cm. So what is recommended is that if you're going to operate on the dominant hemisphere, and if your resection is going to be beyond 3 cm posteriorly on the lateral surface, or has to include the superior temporal gyrus, this surgery should be done under language mapping. The second a uh, function that we should discuss is visual fibers. So we know that the uh, Mayer's loop, that is the uh, visual fibers arising from the um, lateral geniculate body will be running in the roof of the temporal horn. And it has been found that they will run almost up to two centimeter behind the temporal pole. And as we can see, we're removing at least three centimeter from the temporal pole. So definitely you're going to end up cutting these fibers. So these visual fibers are actually affected in 90% of temporal lobectomies. But the good thing is that these fibers are representative of the superior quadrant. So you get a pie in the sky defect. So usually with a pie in the sky defect, patients are not really that affected. If there's a pie on the floor, on the other hand, that is a significant problem and it can be quite uncomfortable. So what should be our extent of lateral resection on the dominant and the non-dominant side? There's absolutely no class one evidence regarding this, but it has been found that it is safe to resect up to 5.5 .5 to 6.5 centimeter on the non-dominant side and up to 4 to 5.5 centimeter on the dominant side for the lateral temporal lobe. On the other hand, for the medial temporal lobe, that is basically the hippocampus, the hippocampus should be resected up till the superior colliculus or up till the quadrigeminal plate for a better surgical outcome. It has been found that an extended hippocampectomy has better epilepsy surgery results than a partial hippocampectomy. But the hippocampus on the dominant side should only be resected if neuropsychology shows that there's at least two standard deviation drop on verbal memory testing. But I can assure you that most of us do not do this and hippocampus on the dominant side would be rejected regardless of this two standard deviation drop on verbal memory testing is present or not. Right, so coming to the surgery itself, so basically the patient has to be positioned supine. Uh, on pins, the head has to be turned 30 degrees and should be extended by 50 degrees. So the malar eminence becomes the highest point. So after you've turned the head, you have extended the head, should also drop the vertex by 10 degrees. So this vertex drop would allow this, allow you to have an easy access to the subtemporal region. 
Okay, so the exposure is through a small reverse question mark incision. So uh, the posterior extent of the incision is basically up to the mastoid eminence of the posterior border of the ear. And then the superior extent is along the superior temporal line over here. Okay, so after you have done your surgery, uh, you have done the craniotomy and you have opened dura, the uh, basic surgical steps are that first step usually is a lateral temporal resection. So the neocortex is removed. We are going to introduce a dissector, which is going to be uh, which is going which is going to touch the temporal pole over here, and from the temporal pole, we can remove up to three centimeter behind. So that is how it starts. So you, you can only resect 3 cm to begin with. So we'll make a cut along the superior temporal sulcus and then posteriorly at 3 cm. And then using a dissector or using QSA or whatever technique you wish to use, you can remove this lateral temporal neocortex. right? So this temp with this, a temporal pole over here gets removed and then the middle and the inferior temporal guidance will be removed up till the middle fossa floor. So the posterior limit is 3 cm, the inferior limit is the middle fossa floor. The superior limit is the superior temporal sulcus, right? So this is how it happens. Uh, initially, we'll just remove the, the middle and the inferior temporal gyrus, right? So that is just the lateral temporal neocortical removal, following which after that, we will open the ventricle and then we'll roll the hippocampus off and then remove the hippocampus. So we'll see how that happens. So after this, after we have removed the lateral temporal neocortex, the next step is to enter the temporal horn and expose the ventricle. So there are many different ways to identify where the temporal horn would lie. Uh, ultimately, if you go on resecting, you're obviously at some point going to find the temporal horn. But the point is to identify it early and enter the temporal horn so you can have a safe resection and not reject areas which you should not be resecting. So one way to identify it is using the middle of the middle temporal gyrus. So just go through the middle temporal gyrus and keep going deep. Okay, so as you're going deep, you should avoid entering the gray matter of the superior temporal gyrus or of the inferior temporal gyrus. If you keep going deep through the middle temporal gyrus, you're going to find the temporal horn. Inferiorly, if you just go above the fusiform gyrus arachnoid, you will find the temporal horn. Another way to enter the temporal horn would be through a transylvian approach. So this was also done by a few surgeons. So they dissect the entire sylvian fissure and then through the circular sulcus, if you enter through the posterior edge of the circular sulcus, you're going to enter into the temporal horn. But it is important to remember that there's a chance you can cut the temporal stem fibers there that we usually want to avoid doing. So after we have entered the temporal horn, uh, a dissector would be introduced, basically any sort of dissector can be introduced along this temporal horn ependyma and then this ependyma is resected so the entire temporal horn can be visualized. So as you can see this is this very very wide structure with no blood vessels and no punctate bleeding is the temporal horn ependyma. Right, so once you have removed this uh, lateral wall ependyma you should be able to see the entire choroid plexus, the inferior choroidal point in the hippocampus. Following which, now that you can see the inferior choroidal point and you can see where the ICA would be located because anteriorly you have removed the temporal pole. So you can remove whatever tissue is located between this inferior choroidal point and the ICA. Okay, and so some of the tissue that would be found still preserved is the amygdala and the uncus. So there are boundaries which have been defined to remove the amygdala and the uncus. So basically what we do is we draw an imaginary line which extends from this inferior choroidal point which is over here up till the MCA over here. So you cannot clearly see the MCA here because this is a subpiled dissection. So but in surgery you will be able to make out the M1 MCA. So there's an imaginary line which is drawn along this and whatever tissue is below this line can be safely removed. We are concerned about going above this line because above this line is where the temporal stem and the basal ganglia would be located. So what we do is we identify this line and then first we remove the amygdala. So that is that is the tissue which is located just anterior to the hippocampus. So it would be somewhere here. So this amygdala has been removed from here already. Then next we can remove the uncus after that. So that would be the part which is located just next to the tent medially. So after you've removed the uncus, you'll be able to make out the edge of the tent, the PCA, and the third cranial nerve. 
the most important thing while removing the uncus is to stick to subpile resection so you don't end up damaging the PC or the third cranial nerve. So after you've removed all these structures, the last step would be to remove the hippocampus. So this, as you can make out, is the entirety of the hippocampus, the head, the body, and the tail. And it, what has been found is that removing at least three centimeter of the hippocampus is important. You have to remove up till the superior colliculus for it to have a decent benefit for epilepsy uh, control. So what uh, we do for removing the hippocampus is after the uncus and the amygdala is removed, we can start rolling the hippocampus off. So what we do is usually cut posteriorly here at the tail, at the level of the superior colliculus, and then we open up the hippocampal fissure. So that is the area from where the perforators are coming from the PCA and they're entering into the hippocampal sulcus. So the hippocampal fissure is opened. All the perforators are coagulated and dissected off. And then after that, the hippocampus just can be gently rolled off and removed in total. It can also be removed at two separate structures. You can remove the head and the body separately, but better to just remove the whole thing as one go. So you can provide a better surgical sample for histopathology as well. Right, so that is about the surgical technique of an anterior medial temporal lobectomy. Uh, following the surgery, it is uh, better to get an MRI after three months the, and a neuropsych after one year to know what are the deficits that the surgery has caused. Usually the cognitive function stabilizes after a year, so it's better to get the neuropsych after a year. Following surgery, the anti-epileptic should be tapered only after a year of absolutely no seizures, and we should wait for a year before allowing the patient to drive. Right, so uh, ATL and amygdala hippocampectomy is more or less a quite safe surgery, and the risks and complications of surgery are quite uh, uncommon or tolerable but the most common complication as we've already discussed is that there will be a superior quadrant anopia almost 90 percent people will have visual field deficits other problems which can develop are language deficits and then the routine complications of temporalis muscle wasting and frontalis nerve palsy some patients can also develop a semantic aphasia and maybe if there's damage to the pca or third nerve or brainstem they can develop diplopia and hemiparesis the outcomes with an ATL and AH are quite good. So this is the standard of defining outcomes with epilepsy surgery. And it is very important to remember this particular value, 66%, the angle class one outcomes. And class one is defined as complete freedom from disabling seizures is 66% for 10 years. And that, that lasts for at least 10 years after surgery. So that is the best outcome that we have currently with surgery in epilepsy for any condition. There are a few uh, factors which can cause poorer outcomes. So if it is found on EEG that there's a rapid spread of seizure from the onset zone, or the MRI did not show hippocampal sclerosis, or your EEG and PET findings or basically any workup was discordant, or the patient did not have classic complex partial seizures of temporal lobe epilepsy, and they had secondary generalization, all of these factors can actually lead to a poorer outcome with ATL and AH as compared to a standard uh, MTS patient. Uh, another surgery that can instead be performed of, instead of a routine ATL AH would be to do a selective amygdala hippocampectomy. So here the temporal neocortex is actually preserved. The rationale for this is basically that the temporal neocortex is actually functional and eloquent and we want to preserve it. Okay, it is very important for verbal memory and visual naming. And it has been found that doing surgery on the dominant lobe, these patients usually commonly have persistent verbal memory and word finding deficits. So a better surgical option might actually be to do a selective amygdala hippocampectomy because most MTS patients have seizures arising just from the mesotemporal lobe. There are multiple ways to do a selective amygdala hippocampectomy and you can enter through a transylvian route, a transsulcal route, a transgyral route through the middle temporal gyrus or through the collateral sulcus through a subtemporal route. The transylvian route has problems because even though it preserves the entire superficial temporal cortex, it involves cutting the temporal white matter stem because we go through the circular sulcus and we want to avoid doing this. The lateral approaches, including both the transcortical and the transsulcal approach, they go through the superior temporal sulcus or the middle temporal gyrus, but 
even though they preserve more structure than an ATL does, they can still damage functional cortex. So the best current selective amygdala hippocampectomy approach is a subtemporal approach. It accesses the temporal horn through the collateral sulcus and absolutely avoids all the temporal neocortex or temporal stem. So the best neuropsychology outcomes actually are with the subtemporal approach. How a subtemporal approach can be done? It's basically done with a small incision and a small 2 centimeter keyhole craniotomy. The patient is positioned supine with a 90 degree head turn. There's a small 3 to 4 centimeter incision just anterior to the tracheus and curving along the ear. And then a small 2 centimeter keyhole craniotomy is made for a subtemporal access. So we enter subtemporally, do the dissection, and then identify and enter the collateral sulcus through which you can enter the temporal horn. After which, we will identify the inferior choroidal point and anterior superior to that would be lying our amygdala and then that can be resected with with uh, CUSA and through subpile dissection you can remove the uncus as well followed by removal of the hippocampus. So we found that with a selective amygdala hippocampectomy there have been 60 to 90 percent seizure freedom rates at three to six years but longer outcomes are still needed to be defined. It does have better cognitive outcomes than ATL does so there is a lower decline in verbal memory but still, we do not have any class 1 evidence to suggest that selective amygdala hippocampectomy is actually better than an ATL. Okay, so the next uh, topic to discuss is resective surgery for epilepsy not residing in the temporal lobe, so extratemporal epilepsy. The basic concept for all epilepsy surgery is to make a patient free of seizures, the area of seizure onset and the area where it is spreading rapidly, the area of fast spread, both have to be removed. So, coming to epilepsy arising from the frontal lobe, frontal lobe epilepsy is the second most common type of epilepsy. We have already discussed how frontal lobe epilepsy can present, but there are basically three main subtypes of frontal lobe epilepsy. They can present with epilepsy arising from the motor area, so that can cause partial motor seizures and we know that motor area can only give rise to clonic activity, never does it give rise to tonic activity. So uh, the partial motor seizures will only have focal clonic activity. They can also have seizures arising from the supplementary motor area, so that can cause speech arrest and this can cause tonic posturing. They can also have area, seizures arising from the prefrontal area, those are usually your complex partial seizures or focal onset impaired awareness seizures with classic frontal lobe features, staring spells, vocalization and bipedal automatisms. It has been, so the frontal lobe is quite a big structure and it is difficult to localize within the frontal lobe as to where the epilepsy is arising from. So it has been found that frontal lobe epilepsy has poorer surgical outcomes than for other lobes. And that main problem with frontal lobe epilepsy is that defining the area where the seizure is arising from has been quite difficult but with the recent onset of uh, common use of stereo EEG this is improving. So surgery usually would be resection of the frontal lobe and we would re remove the non-eloquent region so that can either usually be the medial frontal lobe or the lateral frontal lobe. To remove the medial frontal lobe we'd have we'd require like an interhemispheric approach almost uh, so it requires a bicoronal incision. The biggest problem with medial frontal lobe resections is the risk of SMA syndrome. Now the supplementary motor area basically lies in front of the precentral sulcus and above the cingulate gyrus. But the problem is that the anterior border of the, superior, of the supplementary motor area is not defined. So usually in medial frontal lobe resections we end up removing part or maybe the entirety of the supplementary motor area. Now this can cause something known as the SMA syndrome. It is important to remember that the SMA syndrome is usually a transient syndrome lasting for only a few weeks. What this causes is basically the patient will continue to have power of the opposite side limbs. Tone will even be maintained or might actually be increased but there will be no voluntary movements of those limbs. Along with that, they will have poor response to uh, being spoken to or being asked questions. So they're usually mute as well. Right, so this patient is an example of uh, a patient who underwent a, front, uh, a frontal lobe resection. So as we can clearly see here, this, there is a flare hyperintensity located in the medial frontal lobe. And PET is also showing that this area is hypermetabolic. So this entire area was mapped with subdural grid electrodes and even some depth electrodes and then it was resected following that. So this, as we can see, is all anterior to the motor area but does involve a supplementary motor area as well over here. 
So most likely this patient might have developed a supplementary motor area syndrome. Okay, so resections of the frontal lobe can also be lateral frontal lobe resection. This is a lot more easy and uh, less likely chance of having a SMA syndrome. But if this is being done on the dominant side, usually it requires language mapping, especially if the inferior frontal guidance is going to be involved. The seizure freedom rates as compared to temporal lobe epilepsy is lower. So a temporal lobe epilepsy at least has 70% seizure freedom rates, but for the frontal lobe it is only 50%. The outcomes are poorer than other lobes, but better outcomes can occur if there's a very clear cut lesion on the MRI. So your pre-op MRI is abnormal, you're doing a very focal frontal lobe resection because you know that the epileptic, ep epileptogenic zone is located here. Or if the patient has a younger age, or the patient has had an epilepsy only for a short duration. That is because the longer the duration of the epilepsy, the more the epileptogenic focus and network spreads. Okay, so now coming to resection for occipital lobe epilepsy, this is the least common type of extratemporal epilepsy. And here, as is quite obvious, visual function will be important for both the seizure semiology and surgical management. So it is possible to localize occipital lobe epilepsy, sometimes it's just a seizure, seizure semiology. Usually what you'd find in occipital lobe epilepsy are elementary visual hallucinations, just flashes of light or blobs of color. You can have visual auras, illusions, sometimes visual field deficits. And here in occipital lobe, you get rapid bilateral eye blinking. Now, most of these can also arise from seizures which are arising from the occipitotemporal or anterior medial temporal lobes. But if the patient has had a complex hallucination in these seizures, it can never be an occipital lobe hallucination as they should only have elementary visual hallucinations and not complex visual hallucinations. But the problem with occipital lobe epilepsy is even though we're able to localize with seizure semiology sometimes, it is a deep located structure. The calcarine cortex is usually located in the interhemispheric fissure, so it makes it difficult for scalp EEG to pick up anything from there. So usually there's a poor localizing value for the scalp EEG and we require some other modalities like MEG, PET or stereo EEG. Another important thing is that for all patients undergoing an occipital lobe surgery, it is absolutely essential to document the visual field. If it is found that the vision is completely intact, as we have already discussed in the previous section, if you're going to operate on the eloquent cortex, you have to do a subdural grid mapping to localize what is the relationship of the eloquent cortex with the epileptogenic zone. So if you're, if you're going to resect the lesion and it is quite obvious that the patient will develop a visual field deficit, that has to be discussed with the patient preoperatively. Uh, patients would usually tolerate a superior quadrant anopia, but if the resection is likely to cause an entire hemianopia or an inferior quadrant anopia, that's very unlikely to be tolerated. So this, was an this is an example of a patient with occipital lobe epilepsy. You can clearly see the changes on MRI over here. So this is a lesional epilepsy. PET is also showing that the same area is hypermetabolic. A DTI was done here to check for the visual fibers and the relationship with the lesion over here. So once that was done, the patient underwent a stereo EEG to identify exactly where is the epileptogenic zone, following which they finally underwent resection. So it has been found that with occipital lobe epilepsy, the outcomes are better than frontal lobe epilepsy. There are 65% angle 1 class 1 outcomes, but 75% of patients who undergo occipital lobe resections have the risk of de developing a new or worse visual field deficit. Even with the most experienced surgeons, this is going to happen. Okay, now coming to resection of parietal lobe epilepsy. The most difficult to localize epilepsy is parietal lobe epilepsy. Uh, this is because the seizure, seizure semiology is very non-specific for a parietal lobe epilepsy because there are so the parietal lobe is a small structure and there are a lot of eloquent cortices which are located nearby. The frontal lobe, the occipital lobe, the temporal lobe are all quite nearby. So usually the semiology spills over into these other lobes. The most common findings are usually some elementary sensations like you would feel some tingling, numbness of pins and needles. But the usual parietal lobe epilepsies are very non-specific and can even have bilateral symptoms. Parietal lobe epilepsies can present with either simple partial or complex partial seizures. But usually they spill over into frontal lobe and, call, and might even have a frontal lobe semiology with tonic and clonic activity.
Okay, so ju- the semiology itself is poorly localizing, but even scalp EEG and sometimes even invasive monitoring has a very poor localizing value in parietal lobe epilepsy, making it very difficult to treat this particular epilepsy. But it is MRI can really help to be able to localize lesional epilepsy at least in these patients. Right, so resections for parietal lobe epilepsy, if the lesion is in the non eloquent region, it can just be resected. But if the epileptogenic zone extends to an eloquent region, which can be either the sensory cortex or the inferior parietal lobule on the dominant side, then you can resect whatever part is in the non eloquent region and then combine it with a procedure known as multiple subpile transactions. And as we go on, we will discuss what are these multiple subpile transactions. These are usually surgeries performed particularly for lesions in the eloquent region. So class 1 and 2 outcomes with parietal lobe epilepsy vary anywhere from between 50 to 53 to 82% in the parietal lobe. The, but as we know, this is a very eloquent structure. There are There is a high risk for deficits and the most common deficit is an incomplete Gerstmann syndrome. Apart from that, you can get sensory deficits, visual field deficits, language deficits and motor deficits also. Okay, another common area from where epilepsy can arise would be insular or the perisylvian region. Now this also can be a difficult structure to first of all access and then resect. Uh, It is also an eloquent structure, but what exactly is the function of the insula? It is still clearly not well defined. It is a part of of the limbic system. It has some role in sensory processing and it also has, it is one of the higher autonomic centers. Now, seizures arising from the insula can have two particular seizure semiologies. They could be insuloperisylvian seizures or they could be frontal or pseudofrontal seizures. So, insuloperisylvian seizures are classical insular seizures. They usually begin with discomfort in the throat and then there will be some sensory symptoms. Apart from that, there are so many different eloquent cortices located around the insula that you get a bunch of different symptoms associated with it. They can be visceral auditory, vestibular, gustatory, and speech symptoms. If there is also involvement of the frontal operculum, you can get hypersalivation, clonic facial contractions, and constriction of the larynx. Insular seizures can also present with just a frontal semiology also. You can just get hyperkinetic movements and ipsilateral eyelid blinking. Now, as we know that the insula is deeply located and it is uh, situated underneath the sylvan fissure and it's not on the surface, so we know that scalp EEG will not work very well. As we have discussed previously, MEG is a very good study for insular epilepsy and stereo EEG is also very good for insular epilepsy. So currently, stereo EEG is a gold standard for workup for insular epilepsy. It's absolutely critical. Now, we know that the insula is located under the sylvan fissure the MCA vessels are running there, so it is important to know how to place the stereo EEG electrodes into the insula without causing damage to these vessels. So there are multiple ways to approach this. There are There's a lateral approach we can approach from the frontal operculum and we can place two to three electrodes from either anterior or posterior to target the insula. There's an approach from the frontal lobe itself. You can enter through a pre-coronal entry point and then you can you can, you, then you can place a longer electrode throughout the body of the insula. You can also enter more posteriorly through a high parietal entry point and then a single electrode will be able to map the entire length of the insula. Sometimes if you've already done a craniotomy, the entire sylvan fissure can be resected and then the electrodes can be placed directly into the insula. Right, so once the stereo EEG is done and then the lesion, the epileptogenic zone, the eloquent cortex is identified, surgery can be done. Insular resection would be usually either done transylvian or transopicular as we usually do for insular gliomas. It's important to remember that only the cortex should be removed and the deep white matter below the insula should be left intact because that is going to cause uh, multiple deficits if we enter the deep white matter below the insula. So uh, following surgery for insular epilepsy, it has been found that 62% of patients will remain seizure-free post-op, so that's quite good. And actually, if a proper insular epilepsy surgery is done, there's no significant effect on cognition. So here we can see a patient who actually has polymicrogyria involving the perisylvian region. Okay, so for this patient underwent stereo EEG all around this MRI abnormality. 
following which this lesion was resected. Okay, another important area which usually we would not touch is the perirolandic region. Now in childhood, patients can develop surgery from, uh, patients can develop epilepsy from this region and that is known as benign rolandic epilepsy. But this does not require surgical treatment, it usually resolves spontaneously. In adulthood, if patients have perirolandic epilepsy, it's usually secondary to a lesion in that situation. The, in perirolandic region, if we do surgery, the biggest problem obviously is motor deficits, but you can also develop sensory, sensory and speech deficits. So that can happen in up to 50% of patients. That is why this is a very eloquent region. Usually surgery is not offered for these regions. Now, if there's a very clearly defined lesion in this region, there's a possibility we might be able to do a resection after intracranial mapping for this region. Right, so that is the discussion on surgical resective procedures for epilepsy. So then we'll discuss now the second section for today, that is the palliative procedure. So these are these procedures are usually performed for patients who are not obviously safe surgical candidates for resective surgery. Resective surgery clearly has the best outcomes when it comes to epilepsy surgery. But some patients, even after phase one and phase two and intracranial monitoring evaluation, will not be safe candidates for surgery. So these patients can sometimes be offered palliative surgery. But even these have to be offered after careful selection usually. The usual indications for palliative surgeries are multifocal epilepsy. There are multiple foci all over the brain. So just cannot go in ahead and resect with just one focus and control epilepsy. There's a seizure focus in the eloquent cortex. So the patient is not a safe candidate for surgery. Or it's a syndromic seizure pathology. So obviously there's no one clear focus you can remove and then surgery just cures epilepsy. So the first palliative surgery would we should discuss is the is a corpus callosotomy. So this was first described in 1940. And this technique was discovered when it was found that a patient whose corpus callosum was destroyed by a tumor or stroke actually had improvement of seizures. So callosotomy became a quite commonly done surgery, but with the introduction of vagal nerve stimulation, another palliative uh, treatment, callosotomy had declined. Now again, with the ability to perform callosotomy with LITT or with gamma knife, as we will discuss later, it has again resurfaced. Okay, so the first thing to make sure before corpus callosotomy is that the patient has a drug refractory epilepsy and a focal lesion that is resectable has been ruled out. So the corp a corpus callosotomy is best done for atonic seizures. It has been found that it actually causes an 80 to 100 percent reduction in drop attacks. It also works for unresectable or multifocal seizure foci, usually if they're present on both sides. It's also good for Lennox Gastaut syndrome, Rasmus encephalitis, and infantile hemiplegia. But we have to remember one thing is that it is the best for atonic seizures. It will reduce drop attacks. So before we do a corpus callosotomy, it's important to get the anatomy accurately. So we should get a high resolution MRI and importantly get an MRV and find out if there's an area which is devoid of veins through which we can access the corpus callosum. Sometimes these patients can be a long-term phenotype, so you can even figure out if there is some hyperostosis related to that. The patient should be positioned supine and the navigation is absolutely required for a corpus callosotomy. So the patient undergoes usually a parasitical craniotomy, so it has to actually cross the midline so we can get an interhemispheric exposure. And we would approach usually from the right side, the non-dominant side, and this craniotomy is centered on the coronal suture. So once craniotomy is done, the dura is cut and the interhemispheric exposure is obtained, you can identify the callosomarginal artery and then the pericallosal artery, and the pericallosal artery will be lying just on top of the corpus callosum. So once we get in there, we would confirm exactly where we are with navigation. So after that, the callosotomy should begin about 3 cm posterior to the genome. And then it will go down until you encounter the septum pellucidum. It is to go anteriorly till the anterior commissure and posteriorly till the point where you can see the deep cerebral veins through the arachnoid. So that is the point where you should be able to see the inferior inter internal cerebral veins joining together and forming the vein of gallium. 
So it was found that a study with a 14-year follow-up period actually showed that with a corpus callosotomy, seizures reduced by 50%. So that's quite good. And drop attacks respond the best. They reduce by 65%. Uh, GTCS can reduce by 53%. And complex partial seizures reduce by 50%. But a corpus callosotomy has the poorest response for a myoclonic seizure. Comparing it with what is now its common counterpart, that is vagal nerve stimulation, Callosotomy definitely has better seizure control, but there is a 3.8% complication rate with callosotomy as compared to doing a VNS. So usually what we do now is refer patients for a VNS. When If that does not work, then a patient can undergo a corpus callosotomy. And the standard to do it now would be usually gamma knife or with LIDT. There are risks of complications specifically with this complex craniotomy. You can develop particularly deep venous thrombosis. But apart from that, an EDH, SDH, or meningitis can happen. There are some special complications with the corpus callosotomy. Remember, you remove, you're disconnecting both the hemispheres. So obviously, there will be some problems. The common problems which arise are usually mutism. Okay, and that might actually even happen because of involvement of the SMA or the cingulate gyrus on the medial aspect of the frontal lobe. You can also get disconnection syndromes. So we'll discuss these in a little bit of detail. So if you disconnect the prefrontal lobe, you get a syndrome similar to the SMA syndrome, where the patient develops a paresis of the non-dominant leg. And along with that incontinence and a decreased spontaneous speech. So that's very standard SMA syndrome features. You can also get an acute callosal disconnection syndrome, and it occurs quite commonly following corpus callosotomy. And the longer your callosotomy, the more chances of developing this syndrome. So apart from whatever you get in the SMA syndrome, you can also get other features like apraxia of the non-dominant hand. The non-dominant side can be completely hypotonic and they can keep making some repetitive movements with a non-dominant hand and have a bilateral Babinski response. So this usually resolves within a few weeks after following after corpus callosotomy, but sometimes some problems can persist. So that is known as a chronic disconnection syndrome, and these are noticed months after a callosotomy. And the longer your callosotomy, the more the chances of chronic disconnection syndromes. So some examples would be if you disconnect the frontal lobe, you're, you can develop a syndrome which is quite commonly known, uh, quite, quite well known, I think, by most people. That is the alien hand syndrome. If you disconnect both temporal lobes, it can become difficult to localize sound. If you disconnect both parietal lobes, you can have tactile dysnomia and pure world blindness. And if you disconnect the occipital lobes, you can actually suppress visual information from one side, which can lead to uh, which, which can lead to problems in analyzing your entire visual field. Okay, so the second type of palliative surgery is multiple subpial transactions. So as I had already mentioned previously, but as I'm reiterating now, multiple subpial transaction is the surgery when your epileptic focus lies in the eloquent cortex. Okay, so how does it work? How are we able to do a surgery in the eloquent cortex without causing problems? So basic idea is that the cerebral cortex is organized functionally as columns. The activity spreads from the gray matter down, perpendicularly down into the white matter. The problem with epilepsy is that it is a lateral spreading depolarization that arises from the focus and then spreads out. It is spreading over the surface. It is not spreading down as the normal functional activity is. So the surgery actually tries to disrupt the lateral spread of the seizure activity while still preserving this downward or perpendicular spread of normal functional activity. Okay, so MSTs are usually done for patients who have an epileptogenic zone which is lying within the eloquent regions of speech, motor, or sensory cortex. Now, how we usually do is that a patient who is undergoing an MST should have undergone pre-op invasive monitoring because you have to define what is the relationship of the epileptogenic zone with the functional cortex. After that, they have they should when they're undergoing surgery, a very large craniotomy has to be performed so that you're able to map out the entire cortex. So uh, these patients usually will undergo mapping and or electrocorticography to identify what is the epileptogenic zone and what is the eloquent cortex. Now the part of the epileptogenic zone which is non-eloquent can be resected. 
So usually these selections can be performed up till the border of sensory and motor cortex. But for language regions, you should at least leave a 1.5 centimeter cortex around it. For the part which is in the eloquent region, we perform the multiple subpile transactions. Now how these are usually performed is that for every gyrus which is eloquent, we are going to create transactions at 5 millimeter intervals at the crown of the gyrus. And how these transactions are done, this is the this is a blunt hook which can be used for these transactions. So this blunt hook is usually bent and this length of the bend is 4 millimeters because the average depth of grey matter in the neocortex is 4 millimeters. So this is introduced below the pyre and then we just transact to cause a, a multiple sub pile transaction at 5 millimeter intervals to interrupt lateral spreading depolarizations. Now actually with multiple subpile transactions we found that the deficits are very minimal. It actually has a very low mobility for a surgery that is being performed in the locum cortex and there are only subtle transient deficits in the area which is transacted and most patients will actually return to baseline within two to four weeks but there is a risk of about five percent of developing permanent disabling complications. But it is a very good surgery and it has been found that angle class 1 to 3 seizure outcomes are present in 75% of patients who underwent MST. So this is quite a good surgery to offer somebody who has drug refractory epilepsy with a seizure focus in the eloquent cortex. The last topic for today would be topectomy. So topectomy can be a slightly difficult to understand concept. So basically, it is a resection surgery. You're going to resect, but it is a palliative resection surgery. Okay, so you're going to resect a focal area of cerebral cortex. You're not going to resect the entire cerebral cortex, a focal area of cerebral cortex, but the idea is that it is still palliative. The basic concept is that epileptogenic area usually is in the cortex. So there's no point of removing white matter. So there's no need for a lobectomy just removing the cortex should be enough. So what we do in a topectomy is we remove large areas of non-functional cortex and we hope that this will treat epilepsy. So this is considered when it is shown that the epileptogenic zone is in a functionally silent area of the brain but you're not going to be able to still do a lesionectomy because a topectomy is done usually for specific conditions as we will discuss next. Multiple widespread or bilateral foci are still a contraindication for topectomy though because this a topectomy is still a focal resection but you're still removing large areas of non-functional cortex. So it's usually done for specific syndromic epilepsies like tuberous sclerosis, turge weber syndrome, NF1, uh, DNETs, particularly large, large uh, lesions which might be involving the cortex, some cortical congenital problems like schizencephaly, polymicrogyria, lesencephaly, hamartomas, heterotopias. So usually problems particularly involving the cortex that cannot be treated with simple resections. Now usually what we do is based on anatomic considerations we remove areas of the different lobes depending on usually where the epileptogenic zone is. So in a frontal lobe we can remove the entire area in front of the precentral gyrus on the non-dominant side. In the parietal lobe, everything behind the post-central gyrus can be removed on the non-dominant side, but on the dominant side, we should remove only the superior parietal lobule. And in the occipital lobe, the entire cortex, apart from the calcarine cortex, can be removed. A topectomy is usually not done for a focus arising from a temporal lobe because we'd rather prefer doing an anterior temporal lobectomy there. So an extratemporal non-lesional cortical resection, that's basically what a topectomy is, actually has worse outcomes than lesional or temporal lobe resection surgery. Because if there is a clear-cut lesion, or as we know, temporal lobe resection surgery is the gold standard with seizure-free outcomes of about 66 to 70%, a topectomy does not offer the same because still it is not very clear that there is a lesion in the area that you're removing. You're just hoping that removal of this non eloquent cortex will take care of epilepsy. So seizure freedom rates have been found to be quite low as compared to ATL, for example, at only 45%. Right, so that is all for today's discussion. So let's just, let's go through a few practice questions and you can leave your answers in the chat box.
So the first question is, which of these trajectories is likely to map the insula with a single electrode when you're doing a stereo EEG? Is it a lateral trajectory, a transfrontal oblique trajectory, a posterior trajectory, or a, through a sylvian fissure dissection if you directly place the electrodes in the insula? 4 p.m. Yeah, so the answer is through a posterior trajectory. If you're entering through a high parietal entry point, you can map the entire insula with just a single electrode. So the second question is, uh, look at this MRI. This is a patient who has presented with drug-resistant epilepsy. What is a good treatment option for this patient? Is it a hemispherectomy? Is it multiple subpile transactions? Is it a topectomy? Or in this case, no surgery can be considered. Okay, so this MRI is very characteristic of a condition that is Sturge-Weber syndrome. Okay, and a good option for Sturge-Weber syndrome would be to do a functional hemispherotomy. But the option here is a hemispherectomy, and we do not do hemispherectomies anymore. So in this case, the best option is actually to do a topectomy. Okay. So a patient who has had this surgery is least likely to have improvement in which type of seizure? Is it atonic seizures, GTCS, myoclonic seizures, or complex partial seizures? Okay, so this is not a routine corpus callosotomy. This is actually a picture of a patient undergoing an LITT. That's why we have an intra-op MRI image. So this patient underwent an LITT corpus callosotomy. So as we know, the best response would be to atonic seizures and the worst response would be to myoclonic seizures. Okay, question four is, what is the main advantage of a selective amygdalo hippocampectomy? Does it have a, is it because it, there's a smaller incision and there are lesser operator side complications? There's a lesser risk of visual field deficits? There's a better control of seizures? Or there's a lesser risk of verbal memory deficits? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so the answer is there's a lesser risk of verbal memory deficits with a selective amygdala hypercompactomy. Okay. So this is the last question, and there's a series of questions associated with it. So let's read out this clinical scenario. This is a 34-year-old male who presented a seizure that began with uh, jerky movements of the right upper limb and then progressed to jerky movements of the right lower limb. He then lost consciousness, fell down, and remained unconscious for five minutes. Following recovery of consciousness, he experiences weakness of right upper and lower limb for 45 to 60 minutes. What is this type of seizure? Okay, so this is quite clearly a focal onset seizure with secondary generalization. Now, if this patient presented with drug refractory epilepsy, what would be your first step? Would you add additional anti-epileptic drugs? Would you get an MRI? Would you get a video EEG in neuropsychology? And or would you just counsel regarding good prognosis of benign Rolandic epilepsy? Okay, so benign Rolandic epilepsy happens in children. It does not happen in 34-year-old males. If a patient 
at 34 year old is presenting with features of Rolandic epilepsy should always work up for lesional epilepsy and the first step in any patient who is an adult who has presented with drug refractory epilepsy the first step is actually to get an MRI you will end up getting a video EEG and neuropsychology because it is part of phase 1 evaluation the first step though is always to get an MRI right so here is the MRI of the patient and what after seeing this MRI is your next step would you counsel now regarding the non-feasibility of surgery would you offer resection of lesion with attendant deficits would you offer subdural grid mapping or would you offer a stereo EEG Okay, so here, let's look at all of these options. Counseling regarding non-feasibility of surgery, it is, surgery is definitely feasible. It is possible to go ahead and remove this lesion. The main problem is, as you can clearly make out, it is involved in the motor cortex. Also clearly seen in this illustration over here. So this is, patient is clearly not a safe candidate for surgery. But surgery is definitely feasible. So is it possible to offer resection of lesion with attendant deficits? You can. Definitely it is a possibility. If the patient is okay with weakness, you can just go ahead and reject this lesion. But the best step would be to offer subdural grid mapping. This is a superficial lesion involving the cortex. So better than stereo EEG to map this lesion would be to do a subdural grid mapping because it also has the clear advantage of being able to offer mapping of the motor cortex as well. Now subdural grid mapping showed that part of the lesion is within the motor cortex and part of it is in the premotor area. What is the next best step? Now would you counsel against surgery? Would you reject the entire lesion? Would you consider multiple subpile transactions or would you consider a topectomy? Okay, so the answer is slightly tricky here because just multiple subpile transactions is not the right answer. As we can see, there's part of the lesion which is in the motor cortex and some of it is in the premotor area. So the lesion which is in the premotor area can actually be rejected. And the rest of it can undergo multiple subpile transactions. So the absolute correct answer here would be partial resection of the lesion which is in the non-eloquent region and then multiple subpile transitions for the region which is in the motor cortex. But you have to remember that when you are doing this, the entire motor cortex has to be continuously mapped with uh, electrocorticography at the time of surgery. So that is all for today's class. Thank you so much for attending. If there are any doubts, you can put them in the chat box or in the feedback form after the class uh, which we will circulate.